Commission. Um, I'm John Manette, Chair of the Commission, and I'm going to be uh, turning the meeting over to our uh, uh, newly engaged uh, consultant, Bob Grandy, who is going to be working with us on the zoning um, bylaw update project that's uh, gearing up to start shortly. And she's going to take us through a few exercises and some discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. So if I don't stand at the microphone, can you hear me at the back of the room? Yes. yes. Awesome, because I hate them. So uh, thank you guys for coming out on a beautiful first evening of summer, perhaps, after Memorial Day. Um, so we are kicking off the uh, Newport Bylaw Modernization Project to really look at the community's uh, land use regulations, which is zoning and subdivision, um, in light of all of the planning work that you have been engaged in over the last five, six years. And um, because, well, it's time to do this again. Um, it's been uh, more than a decade since you've really looked through the regulations and made sure that they are still um, achieving what the community wants. And um, that's the process we're going to, to, to go through. So to kick off this uh, meeting, what I want to do is go around the room, um, have everyone introduce themselves. Um, you were warned by the agenda that there are uh, discussion questions. Um, and so as you introduce yourself, I'd like you to um, respond to the, the two questions that we posed. Um, what is your favorite building in Newport and what makes it great? And what has been the most positive change in Newport um, in the past 10 years? So I will be writing these down and when I get a sheet I will post them up, but I'm going to write on the table here. Um, and then we'll wrap up and see what, what ideas have come from the group. So we'll go around the room this way, so we can start okay. over here. Well, I'll start. Uh, as I said, I'm John Manette, Chairman of the Planning Commission. And uh, favorite building, uh, the library, uh, because it's one of the few buildings left in Newport that has a lot of the more traditional uh, craftsmanship. Um, and it's been, it's been maintained to showcase some of that craftsmanship. And in terms of built in, improvement in the last 10 years, um, I'd have to say the um, extension of the rec path. Okay. okay. We get to go right around. Hi, I'm John Wilson. I live in Newport here. I'm on the city council. And this will shock a lot of people. I think the nicest building in Newport is the state building. The best looking thing on Main Street. And I come up with, with a, what's the best uh, change in 10 years? I'm, I'm really blank on that one. I have nothing. Thank you. I'm Dennis Shannad, and I'm the Vice Chairman of the Planning Commission. And my favorite building is, same as John, the library. Um, it's got wonderful architecture and it has been maintained for many years. It's on the National Register. And I think it's certainly a benefit to the city. Um, as far as changes, there again I would have to go with John because uh, there have been a lot of changes on the bike path, uh, intermodal path, um, span even be, uh, long before 10 years. Uh, each year they make changes and it's certainly expanding that street. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi everybody, I'm Kevin Mead. I am the newest member of the Planning Commission, um, about six months in. And um, my favourite building in Newport is that green burn down one on the top of the hill. No, just kidding. Um, it's probably my house, because um, I really like my house. <laughs> um, but if we're gonna, you know, I'm gonna have to trump for the library as well. Um, and my reasoning, it, it's partly because of the significance of it, and partly because it's available to everybody. I think that's an important part of it as well. 
and I think the um, the best thing and the the path is a part of it is um, expanding recreation opportunities. I'm still writing down my house as an answer. I think that's a good one. <laughs> my name is Karen Garrity. I'm a project manager with Northern Community Investment Corporation. Um, my favorite buildings in Newport, um, it's a tie for two of them. The first is St. Mary's Church, um, and it's a favorite because uh, of the beautiful granite and um, the interior paintings and the architecture inside the church. Uh, the second building um, is actually on the corner of School and Main Street. It's the former Bigelow building. It's now an office building, but it used to be a residential building and it's uh, very representative of Newport in the early part of the 20th century. It was built in 1910. Beautiful interior woodwork and uh, fireplaces. Um, so if you can get in and look around there, it's a great spot. My name is Mike Welch and I also work at NCIC and I work with the city on some of the grant projects and I'm not from Newport and don't live here so my answer shouldn't count. Uh, but one of my favorite buildings is actually this one, and I, I think that not so much from an architectural standpoint or historic significance, but just the location, uh, the, the beauty that I see of the vista here, the, the potential I think that this building has for so many uses. Um, so I think this is one of my favorite buildings. I love coming down here to meetings and events, with several events upstairs or out on the deck. Um, so this is one of my favorite buildings. And then in terms of the positive change, I agree with others that this, the waterfront trail and the Crowley Beach connector and the Bluffside trail linking the downtown <coughs> to Canada has been a, a great improvement. And I think it's uh, that too has a lot of potential for this area. Um, I'm Jennifer Hopkins and I'm a um, resident of Newport. I've done numerous things in my life, but I won't claim any of them. Um, I think it, it, I'll go into the past a little bit. One of my favorite places for the strange potential would have been the jail that's been torn down. Um, but I think that that was sort of a wonderful uh, spot in Newport. And agree with, you know, we've got some classics. Um, the Bigelow Building, for sure, is one of the sort of unspoken ones, um, and the library. But uh, I think that we, we have a lot back and forth, and some that aren't in as great shape as they should be. Uh, so, most positive change? Um, I think for, for potential, which is rather strange, I would say that the unfortunate uh, destruction of most of the retail on Main Street and creating what is now our existing um, pit hole. Um, I think that it has a great deal of potential. I think the most interesting thing is, if anybody has watched it, from the site that nothing grows in Newport, we certainly have a whole lot of trees growing in there. Um, so maybe it will be a park. I'm Allison Lowe, and um, I'm also not from Newport, so my opinions don't count. But I'm also going to uh, parrot a lot of the other um, things that were said about the library. It's breathtakingly beautiful. And also for positive change, the extension of the rec path. Um, I know that <coughs> my biking friends come up from Danville, even though we have our own bike bike trail, um, Newport is definitely a destination. So. And go to the table behind you, Allison, and then circle up this side. My name is Ayat Fulger, and I'm a mentor at GRB. My favorite building, I do live in Newport. My favorite building in Newport is the library. Uh, the second one, when he created his rich, I think that property is beautiful. And the bike path is, the walking path is one of the best in the Did you say something else in addition to the library? I'm sorry, I had a little bit. The, the Curtis Bridge uh, building on the Lake Rose, I think, is a very pretty building. 
I'm John Hallenrick. The, uh, I do live in the city. And the, let me see, I'm the fire chief, zoning administrator, health officer, ERB chairman, and 911 coordinator. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little selfish on this one. Um, I, I, my favorite building is the firehouse. Uh, I think it's incredible uh, as the gateway coming down uh, the access road into the city. And then uh, I've got to kind of coattail Jennifer a little bit. Um, I think the best thing that's happened in the last 10 years was tearing down of the Main Street block. It was a fire trap and very, very old, and it's given us the opportunity to hopefully get something in there to uh, improve the city. And this is just my wife. She's here visiting. <laughs> uh, she might have something to say, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think my favorite building um, is is probably the state building. I think that looks that's great, and I love the flags and the flowers that they have that um, that they do. It's beautiful to look at when you're coming down the main street. My name is Helen Lefevre. I am a newly resident in Newport. I've been I'm kind of a year old here, moved from Florida. So the question I was asking, what is your favorite building? So far, I believe the library is still number one to me. That's the building I go quite frequently. It's beautiful, it's maintained, and it's open to everyone. And I also love that the recreational park area that has been newly done. I have a dog, so I might be too subjective about this, but she loves it, so <laughs> I guess <laughs> that's a, it's really nice to spend some time there. Uh, and the second question I really cannot answer, because it's talked about 10 years, and I'm too young to say something about that. Hi, I'm Nora. I live just on the outskirts of Newport, and um, I like all the buildings that have been mentioned, but I would also add the wastewater treatment plant because I've seen what that structure can do. And it's very impressive to me from just a, a sort of layperson's perspective that we have that science going on right here. And I think the recreation path and the focus on the outdoor economy has been great. I'm Paul Manette. I'm the mayor of Newport. Um, I think I'm partial to the library only because I was chair of the board of the library when it went through its major restoration. And it is open to the public and welcoming. Um, a second building, actually, I'd like for the style of it, the old style, would have to be the, I call it the old post office, but it's the courthouse. Um, that old style, you know, that type of building. The biggest improvements, I think, have been the embracing of the outdoor recreational economy because it doesn't just include the recreational paths, it includes the waterfront, um, it includes side-by-side, uh, -side, so it includes all forms of recreation, whether you're biking, walking, and boating, or using side-by-side. -side. So I think that's one of the biggest improvements in the past 10 years. Good evening, I'm Patrick Shattuck. I'm the executive director of Rural Edge. And just for some disclosure, my, my background is architecture and historic preservation. And so when I talk about my favorite building, I'm going to go uh, completely unexpected. And you know, we talk about lots of things about destination. And I would say the pick and shovel. Um, I grew up in Burlington and I went to school in Savannah, Georgia and moved back here with my family and my father wanted to take us on a fall foliage tour and this was in the 90s and we ended up at the pick and shovel and he wanted to show what a great uh, resource that was and it was a destination. And while I don't live in Newport, uh, every time we come in to Newport, my wife says, oh, we have to go to the pick and shovel. And it really goes to show that you can have an active retail anchor that can compete with national chains uh, in your downtown and employ and support the local economy. And it's for that dynamic presence that I'm going to go with the pick and shovel. Uh, and I've got a daughter who's a vegan and they serve vegan ice cream. Uh, so even better. Um, and I think the best change 
you know, people have talked about recreation, but I would talk about the connectivity. Um, and you mentioned the linkages between different types of recreation, but just the experiences you have. When I came into town, I was at a stoplight, and a kid was on his scooter going, connecting to the Little League field. Uh, it's those experiences. I remember coming up, and it was COVID, and we got takeout tie, and we were able to bring it down, and on a very cold fall day, um, still have it in the pavilion on the lake. Uh, and so it's those experiences and those connections that really make your community so special. Hopefully you didn't see me shudder as a daughter of a dairy farmer when you said vegan ice cream. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. So I'm Melissa Pedersen. I'm a member of the City Council. Um, I, as a trustee of a library, I know I should say that building, but I'm going to go with the federal courthouse building. Um, I just love the architecture of it. I, fortunately, I've never had to go inside the courthouse, um, but I just the upper stories, the, the architecture, the windows and things are just beautiful. And um, hopefully the building will continue to serve some sort of purpose here. Um, I think really the best thing that's happened, there's a lot of things that have taken place, but um, I personally have no regrets about the Spates block being taken down. It was in bad shape, it was hazardous, it was a lot, of, a lot of nasty things over the years. And it was interesting because for years, um, when I was down on Main Street with a store, people would always come in and they complain about that block. And I always thought, well, it tells the positive thing about it is that it gives a central thing for everyone to complain about. They can all complain about that and everything else alone. But what will happen if that ever comes down? And then, of course, I found out what would happen that would bind everyone together to complain about. And that was, what are we going to do about the hole? So um, it's kind of served a purpose in both ways. It's sort of given a focal point for people to rally around the cause. <laughs> you want to start on this other one? Uh, I'm Heidi Eichenberger, and uh, <clears throat> I've been in Newport for nine years now, and uh, my favorite building is definitely the courthouse because it's so beautiful. I love the detail as well, and I don't think I've ever tired driving by and ooing and aahing because I love it. Uh, but the interesting thing is, uh, we've been here now for nine years, and what sold me on Newport was the path from here to east side and the outdoor part where we were drinking wine and we just thought that was a perfect place to drink wine, look out the, uh, outside. So that's part of it. And uh, so I haven't been here a full 10 years so I can't say what was there before but the bias I have is that uh, we live across the street from uh, the farm and uh, to have all these pathways and everything is absolutely fabulous. Now, if you could only do something about the ticks, because I worry about the dogs. But uh, aside from that, I love it. Hi, I'm Ann Shirello, and um, I've been here maybe 13 years as a resident of uh, Newport. When you ask the question, it's really strange. Uh, the thought that came to mind, and I have never been inside the building, was immediately the church on the hill because if you come down uh, the lake and you want to orient yourself as to where where's the city where's Newport that church sticks out and it's beautiful and it it shares uh, beauty with some of the churches up in Magog and I feel like there's a certain connectivity in that sense um, in terms of um, what I think is most significant in the last 10 years. I think the preservation of Bluff Farm and then all the work that Tracy Zhao and all the people that have helped her uh, to get the bridge built over, um, over from uh, the park uh, to the farm um, is fabulous. The farm itself is fabulous to walk on. Um, it's just beautiful. The whole path is beautiful. And tonight I'm here filming for NK TV just as a volunteer. Um, I like the library as a building from the outside and from the inside. I mean, it, it's got some lovely features. I'm also going to go with Bluff Farm 
not just because of the trails there, but their significant and their four season trails, because it's a fabulous ski place too, for any of us who cross country, but also because it's become a community. And I think that's something that we're really lacking here. And anything that can bring us together in that way is really useful, as opposed to just coming together with something we quote don't like. That doesn't make sense. I think we had one person join us yeah. in the back, since we went around. So we're going around and doing introductions <laughs> and answering what your favorite building is in Newport and what the uh, most positive change has been in the last. I'm Carol O'Connell. I'm a member of the Newport Planning Commission. And I'm here because my family's here. Um, I spent much time in a large Midwestern city. But when I retired, <coughs> I came home. Um, my favorite building of all in Newport is the library, for sure. And in terms of improvements. I think probably the connectivity of the um, paths, the walking paths and the bike path. I really enjoy those myself. So, thank, thank you all for, for thinking of that and, and going through it around and introducing yourselves. Um, we will Note these, the reason I wanted to start here with what you like about your community um, is to get that sense of where, where you're trying to go, what, what attributes you're proud of and want to accentuate. Um, you've been working on your city plan and the waterfront master plan and those are very much about taking the assets that the community has and taking advantage of those and, and moving them forward. And the Land use regulations are one of the municipality's tools for, for doing that. Um, so we clearly have a winner with the library um, here on favorite building. Um, I thought the couple of things I heard that you said that were interesting is it's maintained and it's open to everyone. So it's a public space and it's a maintained space in addition to being architecturally interesting. Um, so that's, that's something to to think about there, and um, the um, you had two two people who, who mentioned the state building in terms of, and then also a reference to sort of its exterior appearance and, and how it's got flowers and you know things like that. So sort of the amenity factor, um, and of course many of the positive changes that you guys just mentioned are also I would put in that amenity category. So the the paths and connectivity open space, uh, all things that contribute to the character and quality of, of life in your community. So I'm dressed like this because I spent the day enjoying that, <laughs> that aspect of your community. I've been on walking and biking tour all around um, Newport. Um, I didn't get to bring my border collies who would have enjoyed romping through the fields at great length, but maybe uh, someday when I'm not working, um, although they're pretty sure I work for them. So. Um, they, they probably would have some issues with how I spent my day. But um, <clears throat> so it's been an interesting t day getting um, introduced to Newport. Um, so Laura, the next thing on the agenda is the steering committee formation in charge. Do you want to do that now or do you want to sort of hold that and move into the next thing? I recommend we get um, more of an idea how this is going to operate, and we'll talk about the steering committee near the end. That's what I think, too. We should have done that when we wrote the agenda in the first place. <laughs> okay, so um, for those of you who have an agenda in front of you, it's got this big logo on it. And uh, Laura asked for a logo for the project so that we could brand it and people would start to recognize the project. And so the logo um, I came up with had these two interlocking gears on it. Um, and there's a reason for that, because the regulations um, and this project, as I see it, is really about getting things to align, 
getting your planning policies and the recommendations that have come from the work that you've done aligned with the regulations, getting the regulations <laughs> internally aligned so that uh, development review and permitting processes move smoothly. Uh, so this is, uh, the, the two gears are really about that co concept of alignment. So, back up here. So I'm going to give a little bit of background to the overall um, project. So with this kickoff meeting um, today, it's anticipated that this project will go through the year and into 2023 and hopefully be wrapped up uh, by late summer next year. So a little bit more than a 12-month um, process. So the project has uh, a number of components that are going to be going on. Uh, I'm going to begin over the course of, of this summer, these upcoming summer months with what's called sort of a diagnosis phase where I'm really doing a lot of inventorying, checking, auditing, <laughs> looking at what's working and what's not working uh, for you with your regulations, um, really looking at how your community is currently developed and looking at whether the regulations fit the pattern of development that you already have on the ground and then do they allow for future development and infill development that aligns with your plans. So that's the first phase is to really get a good diagnosis of what needs to be done and what the issues might be with your regulations. And regulations, as you know, if you've been done this before, um, are always in need of ongoing um, tune-up. Um, changes to state laws, changes in <laughs> technology, and changes in, in even federal law often lead to a need to change your local regulations. And, and so it's a regular process to just kind of do these check-ins and make sure that you're aligning with what you um, need to do. So after this process of figuring out what the diagnosis is, we then start working on amending language to achieve the outcomes that you want and to, to make those gears all fit together. Um, and that's anticipated to go through the rest of this year um, into the very beginning of, of 2023. Um, and then we will go out to the community again um, sometime in the early months of 2023 with some ideas, get feedback on those, go back, refine as necessary, and hopefully get you to the point where next summer you're in a process of being ready to move forward with adoption of uh, revised regulations. So that's the overall arc of the, of the project. And if anyone has questions or wants to say something, we're a small group, so feel free to jump in and make yourself heard. So that is the first element of the regulations. And I'm going to switch over to the second element that I was going to go through in my presentation. I have a very sort of informal presentation. I didn't make slides and such because I wasn't quite sure where we were going to be in terms of space and such. So I'm going to walk you through um, a little bit of what I call Zoning 101 class. So I'm sorry, it's a little bit like the lecture hall. Um, for the Planning Commission members who are definitely going to be uh, hands-on in the revision process, I hope that this will be a helpful orientation. And for community members who, or other interested parties who might be um, interested, you know, wanting to, wanting to be involved as we go along, it can help you sort of understand how the parts of the regulations work and what what you might be able to uh, achieve with the regulations. So um, I think it's, it's, a good, it's a good starting place um, because Newport, like many communities of Vermont, has switched over to having a planning commission and a DRB. The planning commission writes the regulations and the DRB administers them or operates underneath them to review applications. And so oftentimes the people on the planning commission 
don't have that background necessarily in actually doing development reviews. Sometimes there's some cross membership. Are any of you double duty planning commission DRB members? No. no. Okay. It, I, I wouldn't volunteer to do it if you're not doing that. It's a lot of meetings, but uh, sometimes there is overlap. Um, and have, were any of you on the planning commission in the old days when you did development review, which was probably at this point now getting to be like yeah. 15, 20 years ago? Not in Newport, but in, in Derby, the next town over yeah. when I lived there for a while. Yep. So, so yes. So some, you know, so that's that's an interesting uh, perspective to bring to it. You know, you do, you, don't, you have to be the authors of a document that you don't have to actually use um, in many ways. So, so I'm going to give you a little perspective on on zoning and some of the authorities to to do zoning in Vermont. And I'm going to jump back a hundred years to start, but we will rev through history pretty quickly. Um, so zoning really emerges in the 1920s in the United States, and it emerges um, to address public health, safety, and welfare. And if we look at your regulations, we will find the words <laughs> public health, safety, and welfare. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that that is the foundation upon which the regulator, the regulatory authority that you have as a municipality um, to regulate land use is built. And it, it came out in, of mostly urban areas where noxious uses were invading into residential areas or they were very close together. Um, and so like really bad things were happening. <laughs> you know, brick factories and slaughterhouses were butt up against um, residential buildings. And so public health, safety, and welfare in 1920 was really about health. Um, and, and safety and things like that. So it was, it was a pretty palpable reason to try to insert some government control over what was going on. Now, with that first block started this notion that there were kind of two classes of property that we were talking about. One was income producing property, the commercial things, the industrial things, and the other was this residential property, primarily owner occupied residential property, which was something that we were trying to protect. Um, so these two classes of property and the notion of how we regulate them carries forward as it goes on and has kind of resulted to where we sit now 100 years later and we're asking, is zoning <laughs> causing the problem that we have with housing? I would say no, but um, there are some issues obviously that are, have occurred over the past 100 years where zoning has been used to restrict what kind of housing is where and what kind of other development can be where. And you know, this is that sort of expansion of what public welfare means. Whose welfare are we protecting? Whose interests? Which interests? So that's, that's the starting point. So this is very basic, what we call in, in planner terms, Euclidean zoning. And this is, you have a bit of this in your regulations. This is the zoning districts, the conventional zoning districts, with their list of uses, these are the things that are allowed, and their dimensional standards. You can have a lot that's this big, you have to have setbacks that are this deep, you know, you have to have this much road frontage. These very basic standards. Um, some of it's to regularize um, the pattern of development, um, to make things predictable. Um, going forward. <clears throat> and then there's also some other tools that come into play. And these primarily get used to work on that clump of types of uses that are sort of the income producing things, so commercial, industrial, and then also, in many cases, multifamily residential development. We look at site plan review. That's a component of, of the zoning. Um, and we look at how does the site function. Um, is what's going on on this piece of property compatible with what's happening around it? We look at performance standards. You know, what's happening on this property once you get to the property lines? Is there noise? Is there smoke? Is there vibration? That type of thing. So what, what, what reaches the edge of this property? And very often, uh, 
you know, these kinds of standards are applied only to commercial, industrial, and often multifamily housing. So as we go forward, we get to the post-World War II era, and zoning and subdivision regulations sort of spread out across the country with the suburbs um, and become pretty standardized. Um, there's some, some really interesting historical tie-ins to federal mortgage lending um, leads to a proliferation of zoning. Other federal programs over the decades have helped create incentives for land use regulation in large parts of the country outside of, of northern New England. It's done at the county level, um, but really vast swaths of the United States end up covered by zoning or subdivision by the time we get into, say, the 1970s or 80s. So Vermont we're going to stop on for a moment. So well, how did this affect Vermont? So the first thing, how many people here have lived in a state other than Vermont? OK, almost everyone. How many people have realized that things are different in Vermont than the other state that they, <laughs> they lived in? Uh -huh. <laughs> so any New Yorkers, people from Massachusetts in the audience, or who have lived there? OK. So, there are two types of states, and then there are some weird ones that insist on doing a little bit of both, but there's basically these two classifications. There's Dillon's rural states, and there's home rural states. So if you're familiar with New York or Massachusetts, those are home rural states. Vermont and New Hampshire, Dillon's rural states. So this has a really big impact on your local regulations, because as a municipality, as a city or a town in Vermont, you can only do what the state legislature has given you the authority to do. Whereas if you're in New York or Massachusetts as a municipality, you can do anything that the state hasn't reserved for itself. So you have a much broader range of what you can do. So we are really governed in Vermont by what's called Chapter 117, 24 VSA Chapter 117, the Vermont Planning and Development Act. And that lays out the rules that we have to follow to do your zoning, to do everyone's zoning. <laughs> um, chapter 117 was adopted in 1967. So uh, you'll find a few Vermont municipalities that have zoning that predates um, chapter 117, not too many. Um, and then you find most zoning that actually comes into place um, in the 1970s in Vermont. So the other thing that happens in Vermont is that Act 250 gets um, enacted. And that happens in 1970. And I suspect, since Newport adopted zoning first in 1971, that you're one of the many municipalities that adopted zoning in reaction to Act 250. Um, municipalities that had local land use regulation have a higher threshold before you end up in Act 250. So you're a one acre town versus a 10 acre town. And so for urban places like Newport, where lot sizes are relatively small, Adopting zoning would have meant most of your development stays outside of Act 250. Um, so around the state, you find a variety of reactions, um, kind of regional in a way, um, to what happened in the early 1970s after Act 250 was adopted. In some parts of the state, um, there was really widespread adoption of regulation in order to stay out of Act 250. Other parts of the state really wanted Act 250 to regulate land use for them. Um, I just worked on uh, the land use regulations for the town of Manchester, um, you know, all those outlet centers, <laughs> they have chosen, even though they have local regulations, they had chosen for decades um, to stay a one acre town under Act 250 because their populace liked the added protection that came with Act 250. Whereas I worked in other parts of the state, where I worked in Addison County, um, almost every town in Addison County had opted for local zoning and subdivision regulations in the 1970s in an effort to get themselves as far away from Act 250 as possible. So that's an interesting quirk that we see in Vermont in terms of how municipalities have, have reacted. So Chapter 117 lays out the things you can do. It gives you some specific authorities. There's a little bit of gray area in which you can play and up to the extent that your attorney um, will allow you to do so. Um, I suspect your attorney is not going to give you very much room. I know who he is. I know he doesn't, he doesn't believe in a lot of room. 
Um, but there's, um, you know, there's, there's a pretty clear cut set of things that you have to do. And um, when we start working on the regulations, you'll start seeing notes from me that say, this part, this is just statute. <laughs> You've got to do this. Um, so we can really help refine the places where you have policy choices versus those places where you don't. Um, and that's helpful to understand. Um, so sometimes there are things that um, you basically have to do that may or may not be widely embraced by your community. You just need to know which those things are and be able to explain that this is, this is state law, this is how this works, um, and this is how we have to do it. So we want to make sure we, we do that as we looked at your, your rules um, as well. So under statute, you can have site plan review, you can have conditional uses, variances, waivers, um, design review. There's a variety of tools authorized. Um, and then there's some things that you have to do around housing. There's some things that you have to do um, around some other agricultural uses and some other uses as well um, that you'll see as we progress forward through the, the process. So as I said, that Newport adopted zoning in 1971. You did a major revision in 1996. And they did another pretty big update in 2006. And that's in response to an update to chapter 117 that I just talked about. So I started working in Vermont in 2000 and felt that I had finally learned stuff by 2004, only to have it all changed uh, in 2005. Um, Allison probably had the same reaction um, in 2005. Like, oh no, we have to start again. Um, they renumbered it and everything. It's just, you know, it's no good. Um, but now, you know, there's been some ongoing changes to statute, but there hasn't been another major revision to what it is you have to do and how you have to do it. <clears throat> and then you guys adopted your form-based code in 2010. So you're, and you've made minor updates to the regulations going on. So you, if you don't have, and from time to time, I do start working in a community where, um, I won't say which community it is, but I was one time giving these opening presentations and I, I found this really classic 1970s uh, living room, sort of like the one I remember from my childhood with the orange shag carpet and green velvet couch. Um, some really weird patchwork wallpaper. Uh, <laughs> and I said, this, this is your zoning. You know, it's, it's too bad it's 2015, but um, you've got 1970s zoning. Um, and so you do sometimes find whole chunks of that sort of original zoning still in existence, but your regulations have been updated quite a bit over time. But there's probably still some bits uh, in there. So like things like the standards for your general residential district are very much probably very close to what you originally adopted in 1971, I would suspect. Whereas there are other things that are, are going to be, to be newer. So I gave a little history of how we've kind of gotten to zoning sweeping across the country and into the booming post-war housing boom across of suburbanization across the country that didn't really affect Vermont very much. Um, but by the time we get to the 1980s, the shortcomings of that conventional Euclidean zoning are, are quite apparent. And planning folks start coming up with different tools different ways to adapt zoning to, to be more um, effective, to achieve community goals a little better. Um, so you see things like planned unit development, which you have in your regulations and is very popular across Vermont. Um, this is a way to bring some flexibility to a system that's pretty rigid. Um, you know, with that specification of your lots have to be this big and the setbacks have to be that big, et cetera, and you can have one house on each lot and that's it. The planned unit development gave you some flexibility to those dimensional standards. It allowed to, a way to sort of deal with a property that had more than one building on it or that had more than one use going on in it. Um, and that's, that's often how those provisions have been used um, in Vermont communities. You also see performance type zoning emerge, not as popular in Vermont, but in other parts of the country you see performance zoning used a lot. It, it kind of came out of the environmental movement of the 70s in a way. Um, they would generally have pretty broad use categories. 
but have really specific criteria for offsite impacts. So if you could demonstrate that you, whatever it was you were going to do, we're going to meet the community's list of, of specifications about what your effect outside your property was going to be, um, then you could proceed. Um, and if you couldn't meet those set of criteria, you couldn't. Um, so there's, there's that approach that gets, um, that gets used. And in the late 1990s is when you see the form-based code um, come up as an option a new approach um, to try to address some of the shortcomings of conventional zoning. One of the biggest shortcomings of conventional zoning is that anyone who's been to a hearing on a proposed development project knows that almost everyone in the audience has one question. What is this going to look like when we're done? You know, is this going to be something I want to see in my community? And conventional zoning says almost nothing about what does this look like. <laughs> it has almost no criteria for what does this look like. Um, you know, it has some really basic tools. How far is this thing going to be from the street? Maybe how tall is it going to be? Sometimes, you know, how big can the building footprint be? But what's the, you know, how many windows are there going to be on the front? No. <laughs> Conventional zoning doesn't deal with that. Um, so form-based code actually comes out of architecture. It doesn't come out of sort of planning and land use law. And it emphasizes that and gets at that question of what's this going to look like when you're done. So it emphasizes the building and how the building relates to the street. Um, it comes up with really detailed design standards. Now, some communities do design review as a separate process, often in historic districts, um, sometimes in downtowns, in targeted areas where um, there's an attempt to address that overwhelming concern of what is this going to look like and is it going to fit in our community or our neighborhood. So form-based code provides another way. Uh, by really doing that prescriptive design work up front and in the regulations, um, you basically can cut it down to uh, if you can meet our set of rules, not unlike the performance standard concept, if you can meet our set of rules, you can proceed. And it's, it's a, an approach that, that started in Florida and sort of came up through the southeast. Um, it started in communities that were growing really rapidly, or new town developments. So places where there was a lot of development pressure, and oftentimes places where there was going to be a lot of brand new, you know, greenfield development. Um, over time, in, in the Northeast, it's come to be used in downtowns and urban areas, like um, you adopted it for, for Newport. And so, in the conventional, you know, in the, in the basic, model of form-based code when you start, when you look at what was initially proposed in sort of the early 2000s as the models. You know, you have this really prescriptive approach to the design, but that's balanced out on the development side by a really streamlined permitting process. So uh, it gets rid of the public pro component of development review that you have in Vermont, characterized by the hearing in front of the development review board. Um, so much of that process of sort of negotiation on a case-by-case -case basis through that development review process in a public hearing format is, is, is set aside and replaced with this really upfront um, set of detailed standards about what it is you want um, the development essentially to look like <laughs> when it's done. So that, um, as it has gotten adapted into Vermont, um, it's been really hard in New England, um, not just Vermont, by the way, in, in, in several of the New England places, community, you know, communities around New England, really, to give up the public part. That is such an ingrained bit of New England culture. Um, so communities have, have pulled in the, the regulations and, and more specific standards, but haven't necessarily given up on the uh, public hearing component and streamlined it to administrative level reviews, basically a, a, you know, a checklist if you have it. You know, you're going down through the list of things you have to do. It might be five pages long, this checklist, but if you get a check mark in each box, you get a permit the next day. I mean, that's how it's theoretically supposed to work. Um, and that's pretty antithetical to uh, a lot of, of New England uh, culture, to think that someone could come in and propose 
a major building in your downtown and there wouldn't be an opportunity for people to come in and say something about that uh, in a public forum before it happened. So Vermont communities have kind of adopted form-based code in a hybrid way without really, um, so they, they brought in the standards but not the process usually. Um, and this has created some challenges which I think you've encountered in, in Newport. Um, and also the challenge with the idea that the form-based code probably works best when it's in a situation where it's got a blank slate, where it's not an adaptation of an existing building, it's, it's an empty lot, or it's a really large <laughs> empty tract of land and you're going to build an entire new town or a new neighborhood on it. Um, it's much harder to use for the sort of small-scale, incremental, infill development that is most typical in, um, in most Vermont communities. Um, so it's not that it can't be used for that, but it, it's more challenging. It's much more challenging and is not sort of what it's natively best at. Um, so that is where uh, you guys are in your process. You've, you've tried out several of the adaptations um, to conventional zoning to try to address your needs. And we're at this point to sort of do a check-in and say, are these working or are they not working? And if they're not working, what might work better? So there's one more piece of Zoning 101 class, but I've been talking for a while and I want to know if there's any questions. Okay, so the last piece I want to hit on is the development review process. So there's some things and terms that we'll be using that are important to, to sort of have a good working knowledge of and to get some familiarity with what's available to you. As I said, you have a limited menu uh, granted to you from the state and so we're going to go over the menu a little bit. Um, so if you've looked at your regulations, you, you know that you have in most zoning districts, you have a list of permitted uses and conditional uses. And if we think about the development review process, this is the first important distinction that comes up. So something that is permitted, the, way, the best way to think about it is that that means yes. You can do that here in this district. Um, it might need site plan review, which we'll talk about in a minute, but the underlying answer is yes to the use. If it's in the conditional use category, the underlying answer is maybe. Maybe you can do that. But we're going to see, first of all, in that specific location, if that's a good fit or not. And so we have a process for that. So there's not a certainty that you're going to get a permit at the end of a conditional use question. Its possibility is you could end up at no. <laughs> um, whereas if it's a permitted use, the odds are pretty good that you can get to yes. You'd have to be pretty stubborn about what you insist on doing to not get to yes <laughs> at the end um, as a developer or, or property owner. So in your regulations, you've actually um, are not too bad off um, in terms of thinking about what's permitted and what's conditional. But this is the first question to really think about in these districts um, as you look. What, what is it that you anticipate happening in these, prop in these districts? And are the things that you anticipate happening, the things you want to have happen, are you allowing for them? Is it a yes? Is it a maybe? Um, and what are the implications of yes and maybe for the developer who's coming in um, and proposing things? <clears throat> so you obviously in most of, in many of the districts, residential development is, is permitted. Um, and you also, unlike some Vermont communities I deal with, have commercial and industrial districts where you've actually uh, permitted some businesses, so that's a really good, it's a good step forward. Uh, very often uh, I find this that the community has an industrial district and everything in it is conditional. would be like, didn't you actually want industry in the industrial district? I don't know. <laughs> but that, you know, that's a, that's a good start, but it's definitely a place to, when we do the review, we'll be looking at what's allowed in these districts and how is it allowed? Is it permitted or is it conditional? So that's the first cut. And then your second cut is to think about site plan review. So 
back at the very beginning of my spiel, I talked a little bit, touched a bit on site plan review. So under Chapter 117, municipalities are authorized to have site plan review. You have site plan review written into your regulations now. Site plan review addresses the parking, the landscaping, the lighting, uh, screening, access, basically what happens around on the site, around the building. Site plan review under Vermont statute can be done, um, can be applied to any development but single family and two family homes. They are exempt from site plan review and agriculture is exempt from everything so we're not going to talk about that anymore. Um, but basically agricultural things are also exempt. Um, but single and two family homes are exempt from site plan review. So typically site plan review is done for multifamily housing and for everything industrial, commercial, institutional. <clears throat> it is possible under your regulations to have um, site plan review. The conventional process is that that would mean a hearing in front of the development review board, um, a public hearing. <clears throat> People would come in. Um, they could all comment on the application, but that the um, Development Review Board has a fairly specific set of criteria that it should be looking at, and again, it's related to these aspects that I just named off, parking and access and lighting and landscaping and things like that. So that should be a fairly reasonable way to look at, at these projects, and it should be actually pretty difficult to get to no, you can't, and then an actual denial of your site plan review. So say you've got somebody coming in to put in a, a drive-through bank building, and the planning commission, or the development review board looks at the application, and you know, says this is, this is all fine, the access is okay, the thing, the thing, but there should be some more landscaping uh, between where the drive-through uh, lane is going to be on the neighboring property and maybe a fence. And something like that. So what comes out of this is that the applicant can proceed as long as they put in some fence and landscaping. Now the applicant could say, under no circumstances am I going to put in some plants and a fence, uh, in which case they don't get a permit. But in reality, it very seldom is someone this stubborn about plants and landscaping. And so normally you would proceed forward and they would put in some plants and some landscaping and some fencing and a permit would be issued and it would be good. Um, so it's not grounds for denial that the original site plan didn't come in with the landscaping. It's a condition that gets put on and approval essentially, which is a different thing than we're going to come up to with the conditional use. <clears throat> so the other thing that to think about with site plan and the development review process is that the conventional pathway through the DRB is not the only pathway. You can also split out major and minor projects. Um, and this has been made even more clear in statute. Uh, communities in Vermont had been doing this. It was in the gray zone of <laughs> statute for a while, but it is now more clear that you can actually give your zoning administrator this kind of authority to do this. And so if you have a building that's you know, a commercial building, and businesses move in and out of it. Um, you know, business A goes, business B comes in. There's not any need for more parking. There's not really any massive changes to the site. You can make that an administrative process. It never needs to go to a public hearing. Thus, greatly streamlining the um, process for the applicants. The lower cost permit, it gets done faster, and the opportunity for appeal is reduced. Um, and all of these matter to the person on the other side of the table from the DRB or from the zoning administrator um, in terms of the cost and feasibility of their project. So that's something to think about um, when you look at the regulations is to put yourself on the other side of the table. You don't have to do everything that the developer or property owner wants, but it's good to think about what their experience of the regulations is and what, they're what they need um, to make their projects viable. If Assumably, you're a community that wants things to happen, then you want to make sure that your rules are not preventing the things that you want from, want from actually happening. And so thinking about what your process is, is really critical. So I just did a housing study for Richmond, Vermont. I interviewed a bunch of 
um, builders, developers, um, folks in basically on the development side, both um, for for-profit market builders and some nonprofit housing people. And 201, they all pointed to process. That process was a critical problem for them. Um, and it wasn't the standards of the zoning districts as much as the process. That you know, it was taking way too long to get from the starting point to the end point. There was too much uncertainty. Um, they didn't know going in what they were going to need to get out the other end with a permit. And so one of the things I really like to try to do with regulations is make it um, more detailed and more specific so that someone can actually sit down with them. Um, this might not be the most enjoyable afternoon of their life, but they could sit down with the regulations and figure out what it would take to get uh, their project through the pipe to a permit um, and, and have less opportunity for surprises to come up. So in the process of conditional use review is often where surprises come up for developers, things that they could not anticipate. Um, so in statute, um, conditional use provides some additional criteria that the development review board can use. So you could, and these are impact. So if site plan review was about looking at what's happening on the inside of the property and how it functions, and making sure that makes sense sort of internally, organize, internal organization. Conditional use is about what this use does to the land around it um, in some ways, the broader neighborhood, the broader community. So you look at character of the area, uh, you look at traffic, um, you can look at impacts to community services, um, you can look at environmental um, concerns. And I missed one. Character, traffic, community. Yeah, I did, I got it, okay. So, character of the area has become a pretty broad um, criteria in, in sort of Vermont land use regulation and can lead to some pretty broad ranging um, input and comments that come in at um, public hearings and, you know, can cause DRBs to to go pretty far afield from what might be conventional land use regulations in terms of what the they're looking at um, for proposed development. And this has particularly become a concern around multifamily housing. So one of the things that we're going to need to look at, because this is an area of statute that has changed and is continuing probably to evolve over the next few years, is how you can regulate multifamily housing. So this is an area um, where if you have multi-unit housing that is allowed but only with conditional use review, um, we really are going to have to look at that and have some discussion of what is it that is being reviewed um, in this um, thing. There may be some places in your community where that makes sense, where there are traffic concerns that could come up. Uh, but the question of character of the area starts to raise this real problem um, under the other set of rules <laughs> and, and requirements that you have in statute, which is the, the housing, the fair housing laws, and your, your requirements to, to provide housing that meets the needs of the community. And so that's an area that we will definitely be looking at as we go forward um, in, in terms of what you're using conditional use for what kinds of issues are getting addressed through conditional use, and whether sort of the site plan process and the conditional use process are kind of getting interwoven in a way, um, and they're sort of not, dis instead of being two distinct processes, kind of get woven together, um, that, can, that can also sometimes be a process issue. So those are some aspects of the administrative side um, that we will definitely be looking at. So when I do some of this auditing and diagnosis things, I'll be looking at what um, you've seen for applications for variances and waivers um, come up. Those are usually an indication that there's some misfit going on. 
people are looking for basically uh, some flexibility or an exception from a rule. And if you know needing an exception is no longer the exception, then um, that's an indicator that there's something wrong with the underlying rule that's not fitting very well. So that's one of the things we'll be doing as we move forward. So that was just an awful lot to throw out at Zoning 101 class. Often not the most fascinating topic for everyone. Um, I live in a two-planner household, so we talk about it a lot. It's apparently one of our favorite topics, but I understand that it's not everyone's. So comments or questions? As to what's, what's coming up next, yes, Allison. Do you often get questions uh, or requests to write very uh, broadly written waivers and variances? <coughs> that's one of the biggest problems that I, I know that we just like the gray area between what a variance is, what a waiver is, and sometimes mm -hmm. the waivers are very broadly written. Right. That's a good that's a good question. So Vermont law had variances in it, um, assumably from 1976 or 67, 1967, I wasn't around for that, but um, assumably from that point onward it had variances. But the set of criteria that you have to meet, and I think there's five of them, again, five is a popular number um, in criteria land apparently, um, that you have to meet to get a variance. And strictly applied, almost no one would ever get a variance. There was a, uh, when I started work, there was a, a guy, Fred Dunnington, who had been a planner in Middlebury. He took me out on an introductory uh, tour when I, I started in Addison County, and he excitedly showed me uh, the one property that he had seen in his entire 30-year career that actually qualified for a variance. Um, and it was because they had a spring in the middle of their property, which meant that they couldn't put the house in the sort of center of the property because there was a natural spring on this land and they had to move it to the side and thus they had to impact the side setback. And he was like, this was an application that finally met the variance criteria. So strictly applied, no one would have ever gotten a variance for the most part. But really this isn't tenable because there kind of needs to be a little relief valve from the regulations. You know, some, there's, just, there's, there's, there's just got to be a little bit of reason applied and looking at a specific situation. Now, the question is how to achieve that uh, so that you're not, you're doing it equitably and not arbitrarily. Um, those are all important um, considerations and you know, you're not favoring one person over another. So some municipalities, you know, would give variances more freely. Uh, they would not strictly apply those five criteria um, and use their judgment. Uh, there used to be, in the old system, and you can still have them, but very few communities do. They have ZBAs, Zoning Boards of Adjustment, instead of the Planning Commission ZBA, instead of Planning Commission DRB, uh, set, sets up. And I always thought that the reason it was, one of the problems with the whole system was that the Zoning Board of Adjustment, which would issue variances, was pretty sure that they existed to adjust the zoning. It was in their name. Um, and so they would tend to, uh, to not strictly apply those criteria. So faced with this, that last major update to Chapter 117 granted municipalities the ability to have waivers, which you might think of as a variance light. So something with that, it's not as stringent in its set of criteria. So the real difficulty with the waiver criteria is that there needed to be a physical condition on your property that meant you couldn't meet the rules. And that was really hard to prove in most <laughs> circumstances. Very few people have that natural spring in the wrong place on their property. Um, so the waiver authority gives you more flexibility. So the question is how much flexibility <laughs> Uh, an individual municipality wants to apply. And I've done zoning now in about probably two dozen Vermont communities over the last 10 years since the waiver, 10, 15 years since the waiver criteria came into play. Some do it very tightly. Uh, I know there was a, one community I worked with recently where they only give waivers to single and two family homes. They will not give waivers to commercial uh, properties. 
which is kind of an interesting idea there. Not necessarily one I would recommend, but that was their approach. There's been communities that say, well, you can vary something by 20%. You know, if there's a number, you can vary it by 20%. So if you needed to be, you know, 10 feet back, we'll let you go to eight. Um, there you go. Um, and it's that clear. Um, and then there's others that it's a little more generalized. I always think it's good to provide some backstop for the DRB. They're going to be faced with an applicant coming forward. If there's nothing they can point to in the regulations that says, well, we can't give you what you want. See, it says right here. We've actually put them in a pretty difficult position. Um, it's, it's an uncomfortable position to be in, <laughs> to be on the other side of that table, say, yeah, you know, I mean, what you're asking for is perhaps is not completely unreasonable, but it's really not necessary, and you could do something else instead, and so we're going to say, and the person says, well, what? And you're like, well, we don't, we just don't, we don't like it, we don't agree with you, but we, you know, there's nothing in the rules to point to. So I often do recommend having, if you want to be general in the waiver language, but have sort of a minimum. Like, we're not going to reduce it below X number of feet if it's a setback, or we're not going to reduce it more than a certain percentage. So you give the DRB some room for flexibility, but you don't leave them completely unprotected with nothing to back them up um, in their decision. So that's kind of a midway um, that I've used before. So. Okay. Nothing else on burning zoning questions? So the next component of the uh, agenda is problem identification. So what's working and what's not working? Because if you're doing this project, it must be that at least someone who wrote a grant application thought that there was something worth looking at, but there was some sort of an issue. So um, I would like to hear from the folks here what you see as perhaps some of the issues that you're facing with your current um, regulations. So the things that you think are working well, the things you think are not. Um, and we we'll, won't necessarily go around in a circle unless everyone is silent, and then I will be forced to go around in a circle again. So. Um, I'm hoping I've got some folks with some ideas I'd like to share. Well, one, one issue to look at, and I don't know if it's a problem or not, but because the um, city is relatively land poor, is looking at the issue of minimum lot sizes, particularly in areas that are serviced by both municipal water and um, municipal sewer. Okay. Um, for instance, in a lot of the older neighborhoods in town, um, the norm seemed to be 75 by 100 lots. In the more recent years, the norm seems to be 100 by 100. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously all things being equal, the bigger the lot, the greater the initial investment. So that's one potential question, and, and that also segues into, at least in some areas, uh, variance issues where people want to do things that are relatively small, mm -hmm. like um, add a back porch, add a deck, um, move their steps, um, and find that they run into the need for a variance uh, from a setback. So do you guys have Weaver language in yes. your regs now? Yes. Okay. I haven't memorized them yet. Pretty soon I will, but I have to I have to let somebody else's regulations go so I can learn yours. So I can only keep about five sets in my head at one time. So we'll get there. <laughs> does that you think does that show up um You've obviously got a fair amount of waterfront property. That tends, I often see that problem emerge in waterfront uh, areas. Is that a condition that exists on your waterfront as well? And as to in some, maybe some of the older area neighborhoods that are more tightly developed? 
Yeah. I don't know if it's a waterfront issue particularly. The, the other complication on the waterfront is the overlay of the state restrictions that apply within X number of feet of the shoreline. Mm -hmm. um, that, in some circumstances, could create a condition that limits people's flexibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't really hit, I didn't hit on this during the presentation, but one of the other things to think about with that metaphor of the gears meshing together is how your local regulations interface with state regulations and trying to avoid the situation where you set up an applicant to have no way forward through both sets of regulations. And, you know, that sometimes puts the municipality in a difficult sort of policy question where you may have some things that are very important to you, but they are at odds with the outcome that the state is aiming for. So sometimes I find this happening uh, around some of the flood and river corridor things, the shoreland regulations. So sometimes there can be some internal policy conflicts between how state regulatory processes are set up and how the local ones are. So one of the things that um, will definitely come up out of the audit is that sense of the built form, the existing built form, and how well the current regulations fit it. So what you probably got a sense of from my conversation is that much of the zoning that by the time it got imported into Vermont was actually quite suburban. Um, so the models that Vermont communities drew on tended to be more suburban than necessarily sort of urban or village. Um, so the, the 10,000 square foot or 8,000 square foot lot um, is a very sort of conventional suburban standard that um, when you go to the older neighborhoods, you're going to find it doesn't fit. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's an interesting historic exercise to sort of know how land was developed over time and you can actually see the changes in patterns in relation to time. So if you know kind of when a neighborhood was built, you have a pretty good sense of what it's likely dimensionally going to be laid out at. Um, it's, believe it or not, it's something that there's been fads with, essentially. It's a changing, you know, what's popular. Um, some of it relates to the architecture. It relates to when, when did we get cars, how big those cars were how likely a household was to have a, something like a car or a horse, uh, which, <laughs> you know, where in the days before there was uh, infrastructure, those narrow, deep lots, they had some benefits. You know, you didn't, you had easy access to a road, which was good if you had no way to shovel out your driveway besides you. Um, and you had a lot of deep land back behind you, which was good to deal with your waste. Um, so those make sense in a village setting, and you used to find those all over Vermont. You know, as the thing, as infrastructure comes in, that allows for different patterns, and then as automobiles come, the pattern changes again in terms of needing, you see the sort of narrow, deep lot go to the wider um, lots with the idea of needing to be able to get vehicular access into your property. So other things that are working, not working, I think probably the form based code should be revisited because I think it's too restrictive on the first level. Because I think ours currently requires a certain aspect of retail. And with the current <coughs> trends of retail, I think it might be too restrictive to require anybody, say, to redevelop a lot on Main Street here, to force them to have to have retail on the first floor. Mm -hmm. That has been. A challenge, I, I know that that was actually, you, you've identified that. Um, it was in your request for proposals that I responded to um, as one of the issues. And Newport's not alone with this challenge. Um, the communities in Chittenden County that have either um, done form-based code, so there's a couple of them that have. Um, I'm pretty familiar with Colchester's. I've worked on that one over the years. Um, 
Burlington has one now too, and Williston and Shelburne, um, and South Burlington. It's a real bad in Chittenden County. <laughs> um, so many of them have similar language, and even Burlington has struggled with this need to get ground floor retail into mixed use buildings. Um, the project, the area up in Colchester that's covered by their form based code is their growth center, Severn's Corners. It was in 2000 an undeveloped field um, and is now a largely residential um, area. They've really struggled to get um, commercial to go with the residential. They've tried different approaches, so they started with the first floor residential, upper floor, or first floor commercial, upper floor residential. That didn't really work. So then they went to a, a ratio that the project would need to have an X percentage of commercial floor space and X percentage of residential floor space. That has proven challenging um, as well because they built out the residential portion, the developers have built out the residential proportion of that and haven't been able to attract the commercial tenants that would allow them to then do another increment of residential despite there being ample demand for residential. So um, I would say that, that that is a common issue and that commercial and residential demand are sort of, they're, they're independent of each other. They, they, they do relate to one another, but they operate independently and in, in, in economic cycles and in response to economic forces that are different. So it's very seldom that they're sort of both crusting at the same time and sort of equally, there's equal demand. Um, it's, it's more likely that there's more of one than the other at a given moment. And so the regulations that, that specify, there's a lot of reasons why you're trying to have active ground floor uses on your main street, but maybe looking at how far you push that, you know, the extent of the area that's covered by those kind of um, regulations would be something we'll be looking at in the audit and talking about. Well, and Severance Corners is actually uh, more flexible than ours because it allows for uses other than retail on the first floor. It does. In terms of professional offices, services, that type of thing. Yep. Based on what's actually there. Yeah, and they, they also at some point gave up on the two stories. Um, and they've allowed some, they have like a gym that kind of appears from the outside to be two stories, but it's functional to be one story on the inside. Um, the, the Trader Joe's that went into the city center in South Burlington, that is another building that's similar, that it, from the outside appears to be a two-story building, but it's functionally only one story on the interior. So there have been some sort of uh, decisions with regards to whether or not to, um, so how strictly to interpret that concept of we want to have multi-story buildings and have you know, uh, a mix of uses in those buildings. Anything else out there that heard of? So housing is obviously a big issue um, across the state. Um, has there been any discussion of housing issues in Newport, concerns um, around either wanting more diversity of housing options or neighborhood concerns about diversity coming to their area when they don't want it, anything of those nature, of those, yeah? I think there's, there, there's, there's discussion of a, a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that's coming up a lot right now is um, the advent of tiny houses mm -hmm. and <clears throat> how those can be defined and used and, and, and taxed. Um, Given on the size of the lots, people want to use them as accessory buildings on a single family home with a tiny house in it, or a medium sized lot with a conglomeration uh, of multiple tiny homes off of a uh, single driveway type situation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that whole genre has to be looked at. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that needs to be looked at is the volume of people that are. Snowboarding for lack of snowboarding for lack of a better term to have either trailer or motor homes and, and want to um, place them on their property and have hookups so that they can be used when they're here, but they can leave with them when they head south. 
Mm -hmm. And how you how you handle that as far as zoning and taxing. Is it that permit structure? Tiny homes can be on trailers, they can be on paths. That whole concept of movable housing needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. It is it has become a bigger issue. Um, and the market is kind of proliferating housing types. Um, so there is now a, a, a structural type called the park model home, which I don't know if you have any of those yet have shown up <laughs> in Newport, which is neither an RV nor a modular home um, or manufactured home. It lies precisely in between those two definitions and therefore completely unregulated by anyone's codes and requirements. Um, they're often, um, there's a big one over on the Lake Champlain side in, going to New York, which town is that? It's not in, uh, maybe one of the Grand Isle, um, I can't remember if it's Grand Isle or whatever, but it's somewhere, it's over there it's, as I drive to New York. Um, you drive past it and it was a seasonal campground and it has converted over to these park model homes, um, which make for very lovely um, senior housing. Um, housing. I mean, they're, they're perfectly sized, they are single level, they're easy to, you know, they're, they're new. They're, so in many ways, they check a lot of the boxes about being what, when I do these housing studies and talk to older people who say they want to have for senior housing in their communities. Um, but they've gone into a, um, basically they've converted a campground to become a senior housing project, which could be good if it had a decent road and a decent <laughs> septic system and things like that, which the campgrounds often don't have. Um, and, you know, I think most of those homes are not occupied in the winter, but I don't know that they're all unoccupied in the winter. Um, so they don't move again, basically. You have to, they're, they're so big that you can't pull them you, with your um, regular vehicle. You have to have a CDL to move them. Um, so they're kind of a deliver it and uh, leave it in place type of, of structure. But anyway, that whole range from tiny houses and things on trailers up through to accessory homes, there's quite a bit of proliferation in terms of um, what category and what box in the zoning regulations do these things fall into? And the other, the other side of that is all these portable sheds that are being made now. You can get them 12 by 20, 12 by 24, they're coming in on trailers and they can sit on travel, they can sit on stone, they can sit on a pad. Um, is it a portable house or is it a fixed structure? Does it, does it fall within setbacks <coughs> if it's portable? I think all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so some clarity around those, those issues. Um, I often recommend looking at how the thing is going to be used rather than how the thing is built as being the thing that the, the factor that will decide what part of the regulations apply. So if it's going to be inhabited as a dwelling or if it's going to be rented out as a lodging unit or something of that nature, then there's a set of rules for that whether it has a chassis and wheels or doesn't, or whether it's on a pad or it's just sitting, you know, out in a grassy field. I just did a uh, review of what was up on offer in, for Airbnb offerings in the London area, because I'm working with them to finish up their zoning. Um, and there were three horse run-in sheds that had been converted to Airbnb lodging in. London Dairy is where the Jamaica Cottage Shop is. I assume these were remnants from the Jamaica Cottage Shop, conveniently relocated a few miles down the road to become an Airbnb uh, thing. But you know, this is the sort of thing where you know something like that, um, those kind of sort of primitive structure <coughs> conversions. Um, sometimes the regulations aren't really clear about what applies to them. Mm -hmm. Newport. Lacks an overall plan to develop its housing, a comprehensive plan mm -hmm. to develop its housing, and, and, and included in that, I would say, it would be housing for homeless as well. So a range from single unit dwellings to 
multi-use dwellings or multi-unit dwellings, I should say, to then um, some type of housing for homeless needs. And so I think while we have regulations in place, we need to find structures in relation to property and zoning, zoning rules in place to define where certain structures can be developed. We don't really have a plan for identifying what is our need and how do we need it. So workforce housing, for example, um, additional senior housing, um, you know, and so forth. So I think that that's a missing piece, and it's wonderful to see this conversation now nested within our municipal plan because for many years, for various reasons, housing just wasn't part of our municipal plan aside from where housing could be developed in the city. So I think, you know, we did, I was part of a study in 2014 that asked some questions when we did a large community survey around if people wanted housing in the area, what would it look like? One bedroom, two bedroom, and so forth. We got some interesting answers to that, but not unexpected answers. But there's really been not a comprehensive study of you know, what are our capabilities? Someone earlier pointed out we are a land poor community. It's, I think, 12 by 12 square miles of land because we've got this beautiful lake in the middle of everything that we can't build on. Um, but I think that is a missing piece. In addition to the regulations for the kinds of structures, um, we really need to start identifying needs and then working toward meeting some of these current and future needs for the community. And that's certainly something that statute echoes. Um, that the regulations need to be supportive of, of housing that meets the needs of the community. So it goes, you know, it does go to looking at <coughs> that full spectrum of housing. Um, there are some, been some changes in statute probably since the last time we've done much of any looking at your regulations around residential care homes and group homes and things like that, but probably your regulations are a little bit out of sync with statute there. And that's another area that's, that's somewhat evolving. And, um, you know, just that would be something to look at is sort of your definitions um, that go along with the residential types and making sure that that full continuum of housing types, if housing choice is, is a concern and the diversity of housing types, that, that your regulations at least allow for that. You may over time do the studies that you're talking about and narrow down a little more what you want where, but if you start into the regulations with this go around and, and sort of make sure you're covering a broad range of housing types on uh, making provisions uh, that are suitable for your community with regards to those types, that's probably a good start. And I would just make a comment that what, I think rightfully so, some folks are celebrating, you know, the, the demolition of, of the block in the center of town um, that's allowing for a new opportunity, but what was in there was the result of lack of planning. And, and you know, several people have pointed out the living conditions in there were not really supportive of what, what we'd like to see for housing across a broad spectrum of needs. So, um, so I think if we don't want to get back to that again, we, we simply have to address what the needs are in the community and how we plan toward that. Because if we don't plan toward that, we're just going to get this haphazard um, amalgam of what we had before. Mm -hmm. Well, that was just going to add, you know, anything we can do to add more definitions uh, and more clarity around definitions of type, because I think folks have talked about type of units. Um, <clears throat> And, and in addition to type of units, there are also services that go along with that, which can speak to the success of housing people in those housing units. So I think you know all of that ties into definitions of different housing types, which are constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I spent last summer working on Middlebury's uh, regulations, and this was a main focus of that conversation. Was um, addressing both the, the housing types and then the, the service component because of how their regulations were set up. The housing was okay, but the services were not. And there was a recognition that they did need to go together. Yep. We hit here and then Allison. Yes. I'd be keen to 
see how we could uh, future-proof ourselves. Um, when was it you said we lasted this about a decade ago? Yes, the last major update was about 12 years ago. So, you know, and, and obviously people are going to come up with different trends, but there have been articles about how Vermont's getting climate refugees from elsewhere in the country. Um, there are more internally and externally displaced refugees globally than there ever have been. And Vermont has stated that a way of combating our depopulation is to make ourselves attractive to people that are resettled here. Um, there are demographic changes just going on in this community, an aging community, uh, household sizes decreasing, uh, therefore square footage requirements potentially decreasing. And if we, if we design for where we are now, We'll be back here again in eight to 12 years. Whereas if we um, design a system that is uh, responsive to some of these demographic and societal changes that are happening, we may get ahead of the curve and actually make ourselves more attractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you definitely do want to set up zoning with an eye to the future and not just, uh, you, you, you need to respond to what you've got but also think ahead. So there's a, I think that you, you kind of balance those, those, two, those two factors. Um, I thought that one of the things that was interesting in your um, waterfront plan, I know the folks at BHP pretty well, and I, I know how they normally write, so this was actually a sentence that caught my attention, it caused me to go home. Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody actually had a pretty strong opinion about this at BHP, um, where they, they noted that your, um, existing form-based code language was aspirational but perhaps not practical. Um, and I think that that's that balance point, right? That that was a very large vision for the future, um, but perhaps didn't have the components necessary to make practical application of that on, you know, currently to get to, to that big vision. And so we want to do both those things with the regulations. We want to have, you want to plan for what, you know, for 20 years down the road, but you, have, you need a set of rules that work for what you have on the ground in front of you right now, too. Um, so that's, that's one of the balancing acts that, that happens with the regulations. And I would say that aiming for 20 years is, is, is a really good one. Um, a check-in in the 10 to 20 year range and an up overhaul of regulations is actually pretty common and is actually good housekeeping practice. Um, you often don't end up throwing out you know, the whole thing and starting from scratch. Um, but usually in that period of time, you've made a number of small um, amendments over time, which is what happens with regulations, is that you end up doing incremental small changes, one every couple of years, a couple a year, you know, things like that. Um, and think of that, that cog, those cogged wheels um, graphic. The zoning regulations, all the parts of them are very interconnected. So when you start changing like a paragraph over here and then a paragraph over here, they start to get out of whack. And so they really actually, after you've done that a few times, you're kind of in a situation where you do need to look at the document again as a whole, and that's pretty good normal practice. Um, so that you don't end up with these internal inconsistencies in your document. So there was a lot in the waterfront plan and the downtown master plan about basically activating this area, events, activities, um, and while that's not necessarily entirely directly a zoning issue, a lot of the support for that kind of thing is a zoning issue. So the structural components, <laughs> basically. Um, and in some cases, the use components that might go along with that. Um, and that's maybe a way to also think ahead a little bit about what are the emerging business ideas. You know, now when I write regulations, they almost always include um, basically food and beverage manufacturing <laughs> as a use because this, you know, has become 
a really big component of the Vermont economy, beer making, cheese making, whatever. Um, and so, you know, this has gotten carved out as like, this is a thing we do. Um, the wedding barn event facility thing is a huge issue in a lot of uh, Vermont communities, you know, hosting events. What does it take to host events? What kind of facilities do you need? You know, what do you feel about the lodging components, the performance venues, things like that. So really looking at that set of, of use components in your regulations and if that's the direction you want to go, making sure that it's clear um, how you how those things interface back to your zoning. And that you aren't creating a gap like you are with the tiny house things on wheels, things that you can pick up and move question, um, so that you know how you're going to deal with, with events and the, relation, the related development that comes along with them. Um, mobile food units, for instance, being one of those things. Yeah. How do the regulations address those? I think in a way it's a little confusing at times because uh, Newport sometimes, I, I feel, should decide <coughs> whether they want to go more in a hodgepodge or tourist or manufacturing or something. It's, I, I feel bad uh, for some of the shops and restaurants when you have a restaurant with a, a nice view and you have the probation office over there, it just doesn't seem like a great fit. Or if you have uh, the Poulin uh, Mills where apparently you can make it more appealing uh, it, it it could make a big difference as well, but um, I, I find I find right now if you drive through Main Street, you're kind of confusing in which direction things are going. Whether you want to show the probation hall there, or you want to show uh, you know the Belvedere or something else. <clears throat> which which side are you trying to put more emphasis on? And I think that for a tourist, it might be a little bit confusing. And I mean, it's an interesting question for a community, the sort of becoming a tourist destination, um, and what that means um, for how you organize your community, for who you organize it, um, and those kind of questions. Um, you know, when you do go to places that are heavily focused on tourism, you know, you sometimes, I think, probably the locals don't spend a lot of time there in their downtowns and those really touristy places. And I don't, you know, is that the direction that Newport wants to go? Um, or do you, do you want to try, you know, to thread some center, <laughs> center line between those, those poles of sort of having something that attracts people but still retains a value to the residents? I'm just going to say, I think it's all part of the transitioning. Because we all remember that Newport was a working community. You know, the rain mills have been there since the 19, God, 1930s, mm -hmm. 20s, gas and blue informed that. Well, so I think it's just part of our transitioning from a working, I and mean, the labor sweep full of logs. And I just think it's that transitioning to the new economy and new, new outlook. So I think that's just what we got to remember. And Look, look and figure out also. Well, that side of the railroad tracks has been industrial ever since the railroad came through in the 1860s. Right. The uh, grain mill is the only industrial use left there. Most of what's on Coventry Street across from the pick and shovel, well, the post office is there now. Um, the old H.B. Hood factory has been turned into office space. That's an office building now. And. Uh, but if you go back into that same historic era, across the street from Poland Grain, where um, Domino's Pizza is now, was a hotel, where the bank is directly across the tracks was another hotel, where the parking lot for the state office building in is was a huge hotel, and then there was another hotel further up the road, mm -hmm. and the Bigelow House that was mentioned Pre Bigelow was actually a um, in a rooming Eel house. Eel <laughs> um, so there were essentially five or six hotels. There were several hundred hotel rooms on Main Street. Um, 
back back in the era when that entire <coughs> corridor along the railroad tracks was industrial all the way down through where the, the pick and shovel and the mini mart are yeah. down. So they were all mixed together and there were single family residences interspersed in between on Main Street here. Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the, the interesting patterns that um, emerges in a lot of um, Vermont um, downtown areas is the, the mix of, of industry and, and, and residential neighborhoods, which of course makes perfect sense when you had to be able to walk to the mill or the your workplace, whatever that was. Um, and then, you know, the, down, the waterfront downtown plan also mentions the value of that rail access for industry. It's certainly not something that is going to be replicated. It's not really replaceable. It's, it's definitely a finite resource um, and something to think about um, if, you're, if it gets converted away from being industrial. Um, it might be hard to get it back to that, and there is a real value to it as a um, as an asset to certain types of businesses, like the, the great <coughs> so, um, This was actually a conversation we were having in Middlebury last summer too. They had a similar situation where there was a lot of a lot of pressure to convert some of that more industrial railroad corridor to something else. Um, yeah, I'm surprised that. Not one hotel in Maine. There's not one hotel in Newport. The train, when the train left in 1965, when passenger rail left in 1965, we were basically the stop between Boston and, and Montreal. And that's what fed the growth of the hotels in Newport. Mm -hmm. And once the passenger rail line stopped, the clientele didn't come. And then once our interstate went in in the late 60s that effectively took away bulk transportation in terms of the railway lines for passengers and were effectively bypassed by the interstate. Um, you know, unless you have a reason to stop in Newport between the border and Boston, there's no reason to stop here. So it's a logical economic consequence of a change um, in an economic engine that really fed this area between that Mayor mentioned between the logging and the logging industry on the lake and the railway, which were sort of hand in glove, um, once those things shifted, once logging went overseas and changed, um, it changed everything in this community because we were dependent on those two things. So it's not history that's very long ago. Um, our railway infrastructure still limits some of our development because it brings our community around the lake. That's something that we have to to deal with when we're looking at development. But in terms of bringing that volume of people, that concentration into downtown Newport again, that's not gonna happen in a way that I think any of us can foresee anytime soon. So we have to adapt. Part of the outdoor recreation strategy is looking at how we can activate our natural assets to support the community that lives here. Not necessarily turning Newport into a tourist destination, but using our natural assets as an economic engine that can support those who really live here and work here. But you do have the international waters, and if you want to compare, say, Newport to Alex Bay, which is in New York, I mean, that's a non-entity tourist place, and the only thing that it has going for itself is the fact that it's on the water. And I mean, you know, we've always talked about the tale of two cities, Magog in Quebec on the other end of our lake, and Newport. They're like two different worlds. Um, but if you understand how Magog is developed and what the demographics are yeah. coming into that area versus here, it's a, it's a very different story. So there's a reason that our lake is relatively unpopulated with boat traffic, despite being some of the most spectacular waters in northern New England. Um, and those are things that we just, we can't solve locally on our own. And, and, that is and I would argue example. that some, of, some folks may not want to solve that problem. Yeah. We may not want to have a lake full of boats side by side. Um, but I just say that there are larger economic currents that are global as well as local that have impacted us in terms of our development here in Newport, in terms of bringing people in to support 
three, four, five different hotels within a one mile radius in downtown. Not so long ago, less than 100 years ago. So there were some comments from the back. Yeah, why don't you say I just got uh, two things. One, um, Newport is one of the, what, all the 10 towns in Vermont that we have the dynamic of that we, because we're a county seat, we have the state services here. So while we are also attracting, um, and I work in that industry, so I have some authority to speak on it. We do attract um, people coming in <coughs> to access services here. Um, it's easy, it's, you know, whenever there you have, you know, economic services and, and those, and, you know, courts, probation, and parole, prison, all those types of things, that means that we do also attract the people accessing or being forced to access talking about prisons, um, those services. So, you know, we have the, you know, million dollar mansions on the lake, but then we also have a population that is just totally 100% financially dependent upon services because that's, that's their life. Um, so that's, we have that dynamic here. And again, you know, everybody can, I'm not saying that we don't, we don't want those folks. Um, it's not a matter of, it's only, we can live here, you can't, because, you know, everybody can live where they want. It's just we do have a higher probable population of, of folks who, are, who have to access services for whatever reason. So that also plays into your housing. Um, you know, quite often folks don't have the money to pay for housing, so it's Section 8 housing or it's subsidized housing, those types of things. Um, and then you've got the whole, you have a population, we have a working population that finds it very difficult. Um, you know, you're working, you know, not even a minimum wage job, but a little bit higher wage job, and it's still, you know, rents, rents here are cheaper compared to the rest of the state, but it's still, depending on what you're earning, it can be, it can be tough um, to make your rent. And so that's also an issue. So while we look at zoning, I think we have to be, that's a component that we have to look at also, is how do we, how do we mesh, you know, the four season recreation, and isn't it great and fun, and we can all go out and ride our bikes and put it on our spandex light bra and um, do that sort of thing, while we have a, another population that's probably not living that lifestyle. And we all, you know, we all belong here, we all need to get along, we all need to be able to live and survive and, and be happy in our lives. So I think that's an issue. The other thing, I did have a question, Karen, about the four season recreation and that it has to be an economic engine for people locally. So if it's, so it's local people have their bike, they have to get it serviced or local, I'm not sure exactly what that means. What I'm saying is that, and again, it's just a broad stroke, but using our natural assets as an economic engine, meaning drawing people, whether they're local or from away and how far away, but bringing people into the area to use uh, some of these natural assets, and they will maybe stay overnight, maybe spend money at a restaurant, maybe decide to move here. We've had a, a lot of that lately, actually. But as an economic engine, it is bringing new dollars into our community right. so that we're not passing the same dollar around okay. that we have to everybody. I just else. wanted that clarified. It is we yeah. are trying to draw new money, just not circulating the same money around. No, it's, yeah. I didn't mean for it to sound like we're doing it for just the people who live here. I mean, it's a great benefit for the people yeah. who live here to have Definitely. it as well. But the idea is an economic engine is to actually spawn some new growth and, and some new um, investment in the area from from, from new dollars. Mm -hmm. So, thanks. Sorry, no, I'm done. Oh, yeah, I did one more comment to that. I'm also noting that where we are in the time, how, many, how, how long we said we would hold you here. So maybe we do one more comment, and unless somebody else has something really burning on that, we can kind of turn back to the closeout and the structure of how we're going to proceed forward. I don't know. I thought I, saw I actually had a question because I'm new here and I'm one of those people that moved here for the beauty of it, uh, you know, and the climate and all that. And I was, what about the restoration piece of, of Newport that already had the one time? I would like to know what happened with all the lighthouses on the lake. I used to live they in a lake in Europe, in kind of you know I know it's quite different, but try to restore. Not so much renovations, but restoring what Newport used to be. As simple as that. Not, not going and doing things that have not been here, but the things that have been here. So they were all decommissioned. Okay. And in terms of their use, 
uh, you know, again, you have to go back in the history to see what the decisions were, but my sense was that they would be expensive uh, to upkeep to, and mm -hmm. to, and there would be some liability with them as well. And you didn't have the steamboats anymore, the toilet boats. Yeah, the big, exactly. The boat lay the lake, or the yeah. infamous, they all were gone. Once all of that population went, I mean, it, it is a commercial lake and it still functions, it can function as a commercial lake, um, but the need for the lighthouses just wasn't there. Yeah. And once they were decommissioned, they were gone. They were all gone. of them. All Except, of them. well, yeah, there's a. Yeah. It's, it has well, there's one actually lighthouse up the lake, but it's exactly. only for navigation against uh -huh. the sandbar and yeah. blocks. Okay. Yeah. But again, it's all, it's just a response to some of these larger changes, yeah, you know, in, in the economic history of the area. Sure. Okay, Laura, we were going to close up with a little bit of sort of talk of next steps and how we're going to structure moving ahead. So I already talked a little bit about the next step being working through the diagnosis piece, um, and then that will result to, you're probably not going to see me around immediately uh, again for, until probably closer to August or so. Um, we'll come back with, with that piece. Um, and be ready to talk through that. Um, but I don't know what else you wanted to say at this point, Laura. Well, at this point, it seems that um, you're going to do some analytics. It seems like the point person that you're going to speak to is probably our John Hermer, who's our acting zoning administrator, and probably members of the Planning Commission and the DRB. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so um, my guess is that we're probably going to have another meeting similar to this after you've done your analytics. Yeah. At what point do you foresee meeting the steering committee? So the schedule, if we if we manage to maintain the schedule, which is a strong aim of mine, um, is is that we would be starting that process probably in September. So. Um, with sort of more regular meetings and reviewing of um, regulatory documents. So this, this um, audit will basically be a report, a written report, um, with some recommendations. In some cases it may be a specific recommendation because there's sort of a right answer. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, <laughs> why. This is kind of what you've got to do. As I said, sometimes you don't have a lot of choices on these matters. And then there may be other um, areas where there might be other approaches. So I may have more than one approach that could work. Um, I can outline, sometimes in, in these memos I outline, sort of these are different ways of, of addressing this issue that you've got going here. Um, pros and cons, there's not as quite a clear cut right answer sometimes. Um, there's choices. Um, and you choose the one that works for you. Um, you know, and the criteria you know you think about may vary um, from from decision point to decision point. But you've got what your plans are telling you you're trying to achieve. You've also got to think through uh, your administrative capacities. Um, where John is trying to do everything. Um, so thinking about what you can actually um, sustain and manage as a community from a, the regulatory perspective going forward is an important consideration. And maybe no one put this on the not working category, but I would say that's probably one of the issues with your farm-based code um, is the level of administrative capacity it takes to really implement it. Um, and it's very difficult for a small community like Newport um, to, to have that um, capacity. So. That, that could be a criteria you're looking at. There, there may be others as well as we sort of go forward. So this, this, this um, report, which should be done in August, will be kind of a kickoff to thinking about how to go forward with the regulations, and then we'll proceed forward through those revisions in a fairly structured and organized fashion um, with the anticipation of, of getting that done sort of by the very beginning of next year, some kind of a initial rough draft um, to look at. And then, like I said, community process cycle. 
What um, what's the process that you'll be using to do the initial audit? Is that where you'll be reviewing it from your vantage point, or will you be engaging any of the people in Newport to do your audit? For example, you might come across a portion in the regulations and say, well, I wonder how this has worked for them. Call John Parliament or John Bennett. I'm so, just wondering how to set that up for to support you through that. Yes. Um, you did suggest in, in your um, work, your scope of work, um, doing interviews with, with key folks along the way. Um, some of that may happen in that transition phase between the initial report and actually starting to work on the regulations to kind of get feedback on the options um, that are laid out in the report. That in some cases it may be that I will be reaching out for some um, information on sort of existing conditions type things and sending some things back through the staff, okay. city so, staff for kind of review. So it sounds like if we don't hear from you for a month or two, it's okay. I will try to send you periodic emails to let you know how things are going. And I, I will probably have, because of this audit contains several pieces, there will probably be pieces of it kind of coming forward and then at the end there will be one look, I'll put it all together but um, so there's the um, sort of what I would classify as a neighborhood or block based analysis which is the part that's looking at what's actually built and what the pattern is um, and then comparing that back to your current regulations um, that I've already got underway and I anticipate um, getting that piece to you relatively soon um, and that's going to be something that will have sort of maps and information um, as a starting point. So that piece will probably come along and then um, the walkthrough of the, the town plan stuff and uh, the waterfront development plan. And then looking at the, prog the state programs will be the other piece of that. So the state has the, you have a designated downtown and that has some program requirements that are connected to your zoning regulations and you are also asked to look at the requirements for getting a neighborhood development area designation which is another state program that's connected <laughs> and ties into your downtown uh, but it's meant to support housing um, development in the community so um, I'll look through the requirements for that program and, and let you know sort of whether you're in a position to, to move forward and you could potentially seek a, a neighborhood designation or whether you would need to have some specific changes made to the regulations to, to be eligible. So that'll be part of the review. So the, the review has a couple of components and then, like I said, we would look at you know, what's been going on from a permitting perspective, variances, waivers, what you've seen going on will feed into that too. So. That sounds good. So all the people in this room, I know, who, I know who they are. I know how to reach them. So if uh, if and when the next meeting is scheduled, I can reach out to these folks as well as the other folks who are included in the general distribution. Mm -hmm. I included uh, some developers and some landowners, um, some real estate agents. So a lot of them have email me with regrets for not coming tonight, but they do want to be kept informed. So I think we have some opportunity here to reach out to a critical audience. Good. Yeah, it's definitely, and this is going to maybe to the Planning Commission, it's always useful to hear from the folks who use the regulations on a more frequent basis. Um, so that typically tends to be people on the development side, sometimes it's the professionals in your community, engineers, um, or others who help people put together applications that are kind of frequent, um, frequently appear before the DRB. Um, they are a good source to hear what their perspective is. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily agree with every bit of their perspective. And there may be some differences about what you think are critical for the community and what they think is critical for their clients. But at least understanding and hearing their idea about, um, because they're the, they're the most um, kind of practiced and familiar with the regulations. Um, a lot of particularly residential property owners in the community 
you know, their, their concerns are about the regulations are actually usually pretty limited to a, a narrow slice of the rules, you know, what, what can happen in their immediate neighborhood, what they can do with their property. Um, whereas, you know, that's the broader parts of the regulations, you know, what you allow for signage on <laughs> buildings or, you know, what the parking requirements are for different types of businesses. You're not going to get much feedback from, from a lot of, of residents on those issues necessarily. So sometimes looking to those folks who are sort of, I would put more in that sort of professional category, um, can be helpful to give you a perspective. <laughs>